Good morning and welcome to what promises to be a stimulating and thought-provoking day involving four distinct symposia honoring the inauguration of our new president, Robert A. Brown. I am David Campbell, the provost of Boston University, and I'm delighted to be here with you today and with our distinguished guests and visitors. I'm also delighted to welcome those of you who have joined us via live webcast. I would remind uh, the speakers and the questioners to use the microphones because we do have people watching this on webcast. A milestone such as this in an institution's history invariably promotes musings about where we have been and where we are going. Yesterday, amid wonderful pomp and circumstance, President Brown told us that he had, uh, that we needed imagination, that he had a vision of where BU was going. He didn't refer to it, but he might have quoted our, one of our most famous uh, graduates, Martin Luther King, uh, I have a dream. The founders of Boston University had a vision that a great educational institution, available to all, fully engaged in the world, and providing leadership in education, research, outreach, and service could be built here at Boston University. And today we will see how far we have gone in achieving it and what we still have to do. We live in a very different world than that of Lee Claflin, Jacob Sleeper, Isaac Rich, and William Warren. But their vision is still a guiding force for our institution. In our symposium today, we take on the challenge of examining how best to move forward in the 21st century, remaining fully engaged in our world and continuing to nurture excellence in our core values. Our first symposium will consider just how we address some of the most critical global issues facing us today. The chairs for this session are Gerald T. Kirsch, Associate Dean of, for Global Health at the Boston University School of Public Health and Director of the Global Health Initiative, and Ronald K. Richardson, Director of the African American Studies Program here at Boston University. Professor Richardson received his PhD in European History from the State University of New York at Binghamton and has taught at SUNY Binghamton, the University of Rhode Island, Howard University, and Clark University in Worcester, Mass, before coming to Boston University. Before, he, before coming to BU, Professor Richardson was Assistant Dean at the University of Rhode Island and at Fordham University in the Bronx, New York. His teaching and research encompass intellectual history, the history and culture of imperialism, world history, and Afro-Asian relations. Professor Richardson is the author of The Moral Imperium, Afro-Caribbeans, and the Transformation of British Rule. At this point, I will turn the program over to Professor Richardson, who will moderate the first session and introduce his co-chair, Professor Kirsch. Ron? Good morning, and thank you all for uh, coming on this auspicious occasion. I'd like to welcome you to our symposium, the first symposium of the day, Boston U University in the World, which opens today's series of discussions, celebrating the university's rich history and promising future and the inauguration of our 10th president, Robert A. Brown. Our first speaker, Dr. Gerald Kirsch, served with me as co-chair in organizing this symposium. Dr. Kirsch comes to Boston University, for, university after two years, two years ago, from the National Institute of Health where he served as director at the Fogarty International Center from 1998 to 2003. A recognized leader in global health issues with a passion for finding solutions to the widening gap in health disparities around the world, Dr. Kirsch currently serves as the director of the Global Health Initiative at Boston University, assistant provost of the medical campus, and associate dean for global health at the School of Public Health. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kirsch. Thank you, Ron, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. As we planned uh, the opening session of this symposium in honor of Dr. Robert Brown, the 10th president of Boston University, the theme of Boston University in the world, we were cognizant of several issues. First, this is a global university. We have over 4,500 international students and scholars at Boston University, representing 140 nations of the world. We have one of the most extensive programs of study abroad of any U.S. university in our centers of excellence in the developed world and increasingly in the developing world. Our graduates and our faculty influence the daily outcomes of the lives of literally billions of human beings around the globe, including people like Robert Mulford, the U.S. ambassador to India, 
of Francisco Sangani, the former Minister of Health of Mozambique, and currently the Director of the Partnership for Maternal, Newborn, and Child Health in Geneva. Or Professor Richard Lang, who's now working with the World Health Organization, leading efforts to promote rational policies on the use of medicines and their availability in developing countries, and countless others. We were aware as well of the dual themes of the inauguration of President Brown, to celebrate our legacy and forge our future. But when we look at the legacy of the 20th century, it does not look as bright as the legacy of the university. While there have been enormous strides in science, in health, communications, and other fields, our world has seen war after war, genocides, increasing numbers of people living in poverty, a degrading environment, and many, many other serious and profound problems. We've now crossed into a new millennium. And when we look ahead to the future, we can see the enormous political, economic, environmental, social, and health challenges ahead as disparities unsolved lead to despair and conflict. And yet with challenge comes opportunity, particularly when thoughtful and resourceful people determine that it is time to resolve conflict and heal our world. Such people inhabit our university, our faculty, our students, our staff, and our alumni. It's the generation and the use of knowledge that propels societies forward. And yet knowledge without attached values can bring us to the brink of disaster. At the same time, values separated from knowledge are in danger of being false and can easily lead us astray. When we see the problems at our doorstep, right in front of us, some will ask, why should we look beyond to lands far away and cultures and people we know little about? That short question, why, is the genesis of the theme we wish to explore this morning. The role and responsibility of a great university to address the critical global issues of our time. Why should we care and what are we doing about it? We've invited two great scholars to explore these questions, one from outside of Boston University and one from within. Their remarks will be followed by brief comments by three of our faculty who represent some of the many diverse disciplines and faculty expertise at Boston University. And at the end, we will have time for your questions and comments, and we will invite you to do so. And now I turn the session back to my co-chair, Professor Ronald Richardson, who will introduce our speakers and moderate the proceedings. Ron. Since the beginning of recorded history, humanity has been scourged by hunger, disease, and want. The overwhelmingly obtrusive presence of these demons has led most of us to regard them as unalterable features of the human condition to which we must learn to adapt. That stoic view has very recently begun to change as the community of nations commits itself to eradicating poverty and disease in our time. This sea change is due in no small part to the tireless labors of our first speaker. Dr. Jeffrey Sachs is the director of the Earth Institute, Quetlet Professor of Sustainable Development, and Professor of Health Policy and Management at Columbia University. He is also the director of the United Nations Millennium Project and special advisor to UN Secretary General Kofi Annan. His work in sustainable development, disease control, and debt reduction for developing nations has positively impacted many parts of the world, including South America, Eastern Europe, Asia, Africa, and the countries of the former Soviet Union. Well, what's left? Time Magazine named him among the 100 most influential leaders in 2004 and again in 2005, and he is the 2005 recipient of the Sergeant Shriver Award for Equal Justice. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Jeffrey Sachs. Professor Richardson, thank you for the lovely introduction. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, my good friend Jerry Kirsch, uh, 
particular as well. Thank you for the honor of uh, having me here to help celebrate the inauguration of your new wonderful president, Robert Brown. It really is a, a great pleasure to be here, and I also feel it's, a, it's an important occasion. And I'm delighted that Boston University has taken on as the very first part of a day-long symposium on the role of the university this critical issue of the role of the university in the world. Because I think for the 21st century, there is no more important question for great American universities, for great centers of learning in any part of the world, but how they relate to the entire world. We live in such an interconnected global society that is fraught with so many perils now that if we believe for a moment that we can neglect what's happening in any part of the world, we're going to find that the consequences will indeed be profound and hugely adverse for all of us. And I think the challenges that lie ahead are unfortunately not well understood. In most of society, they are complex. They are global in scale. They are unprecedented in many ways. They are deeper and more profound than we have yet realized. I tend to see the 21st century ahead uh, as uh, the need to cross through uh, three uh, great mountain chains uh, to find our path in a fragile and precarious world through uh, finding the mountain passes in uh, three profound challenges. The first challenge, and I think by far the most urgent, it's the life and death challenge for us now, is the challenge of the dispossessed on the planet. The billion or more people who struggle every day for their survival, for whom decisions that we take or don't take are a matter literally of life and death. The people for whom getting enough water to drink and hoping that it's safe enough to stay alive today is uh, a challenge that uh, commands uh, all of the household's resources. The billion or so people for whom a temporary fluctuation of rainfall, 10 days of lost rainfall, might mean the failure of a crop, and with the failure of a crop, mass famine, as is now occurring in so much of sub-Saharan Africa. And people who are living on such a fragile edge of survival that the data show something absolutely startling. It makes your skin crawl in a way, which is that when the rains fail in Africa, the probability of war rises decisively. That's how fragile is the physical survival of those battling hunger by trying to live off an increasingly stressed physical environment. The people for whom when a mosquito bites and carries a bolus of uh, malaria pathogens, uh, don't have a clinic nearby, don't have a $5 bed net to protect them from the mosquito in the first place, nor a $1 drug treatment that is 100% reliable if it's gotten in time. And how many mothers have I met in the last years who have carried children 5 or 10 or 15 kilometers on their back, often with the child dead before they arrive at the clinic, or to arrive at the clinic and to have no medicine available. Make no mistake about it, the 10 million people or so who die every year for the simple reason that they are too poor to stay alive are not only a tragedy in our midst, but they are very much our grave problem as well. We learned, and the next speaker, one of all of our heroes uh, on this planet, is witness to what happens when life is ignored and life is scorned. And without drawing any direct analogies, the idea that somehow we can leave 10 million people to die every year for want of a dollar, for want of a local clinic, for want of a $5 bed net, is not only a startling testimony to our global civilization, but is a startling risk to our lives as well as to their lives. I've tried to make that point for many years, as have many others, but probably Osama bin Laden made it pretty dramatically, uh, clearly for everybody at the beginning of the week when he said, bring the jihad to Sudan. 
That is a hungry, water-stressed, disease-ridden environment where a jihad will just find its natural home as it's already finding mass killing in Darfur and elsewhere. At the core is extreme poverty and desperate people subject to manipulation, to desperation, to a fight for survival which turns into a mayhem and a war of all against all. Now the good news is that this can be ended because when you add up the $5 for the bed nets and the $1 for the pills and the $90 for a bag of fertilizer and all the other things that would make a difference consequentially not only to save millions of lives but to help people once and for all out of extreme poverty. We have the tools, we have the science, we have the knowledge to do it. We just haven't seen it as our struggle yet. But we're finding it is our struggle and we're learning step by step that a military approach to these issues will never suffice. They are meaningless in the face of this kind of instability that has as its root such suffering and such deprivation. I wish I could simply say that the battle against extreme poverty was the 21st century battle. The good news is it can be won well before the end of the 21st century. I would put it in our generation's time to win this battle. But I also have to say that if we climb this particular summit, we're going to see two more mountains ahead of us uh, that are uh, also challenging. The 21st century is also going to be a time of profound socioeconomic tectonic change on the planet. We already feel it happening. We know that the old verities of a North Atlantic-led world system is no longer the case. The idea of the U.S. as sole superpower is one of the great myths exploding before our eyes. It's a nonsense. Yes, we may have the biggest army, but it doesn't make us a sole superpower. There are no superpowers now. And there's a shifting tectonics on the planet where Asia, after 500 years of relative decline to the rise of the West is finding its own feet and rising in power dramatically. And I regard this all to the good, I have to say, at least provisionally so, because what it means fundamentally is that the benefits of science and technology and the learning can reach more people to improve material conditions. It can happen in Africa. It is happening in India and in China and elsewhere in Asia but it's going to change dramatically the kind of world we live in. The economic center of gravity for the world by mid-century will be Asia, uh, and the roles of the United States and Europe will, in relative terms, be much diminished. And I raise all of this because the harrowing experience of the 20th century is that rising powers, challenging leading powers, have often unleashed the greatest of all wars. And one of the things we will need in our wisdom is to accommodate the rise of India and China and other powers and understand that this is for the benefit of the world and that this is a possibility, as Adam Smith said 230 years ago, for each part of the world to help relieve the wants and needs of other parts of the world rather than a challenge to some kind of illusory preeminence or dominance or supremacy or hegemony of the United States. This will require a great amount of understanding, historical insight, empathy, uh, and uh, appreciation of uh, some deeper truths which often seem to evade us in our society these days. If we cross that second mountain, and we better do it because that one could really blow up all. If we cross that second mountain, I have to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, there's one more to pass at least. And that's going to be the realization that is growing, but still perhaps hasn't reached Washington yet, at least. And that is that the rise of material well-being, which we so much want, has become a human war against the planet itself. The, the very physical and biological underpinnings of our survival and our coexistence with the millions of other species on the planet is a threat in an absolutely unprecedented way. If you read the editorial page of the Wall Street Journal, I might say don't, uh, but if you do, uh, you wouldn't know it because you'd be told about junk science and you'd be confused and you would see short-term interests absolutely obscuring the most fundamental facts 
that every major ecosystem on this planet is under unprecedented stress. It's climate change and all that that attends. It's destruction of habitats on the terrestrium, its destruction of the ocean fisheries, it's the new zoonotic diseases which are coming as human society impacts habitats and animal reservoirs of disease that have not been a part and parcel of our, our human environment before and that's where SARS and that's where avian flu and that's where uh, AIDS itself uh, has come from as a zoonotic transmission from uh, animals to humans that came from an impact of human society on, uh, on uh, habitats where we had not been before. We have to find a way to match our legitimate aspirations for material well-being and the universally legitimate aspirations of any part of the world to share in that well-being with sanity of how we react, respond to, and live together with the ecosystems which sustain us. And that will be the third great mountain pass that we'll have to cross in the 21st century. Now my own view is that universities have a unique role, not a sole role, but they have a unique role to play in all three of these challenges, and a role that we have not fully taken up yet. Why the centrality of the universities? First, as never before on a crowded planet with six and a half billion people, going up to nine billion if we don't blow ourselves up by mid-century, with an economic throughput of $50 trillion rising to more than $200 trillion per year if we don't destroy our prosperity, we will need science-based solutions to these challenges of extreme poverty, of the changing economic tectonics, and of the assault on the ecosystems. We will need fundamentally science and technology as a critical step out of the binds that we are in. Only universities can provide that kind of breadth and depth of science and technical knowledge to make it possible to find a way forward. All ideas that will somehow go back to a simpler past are impossible on a planet as crowded as ours is if people are to stay alive and to have the aspirations of longevity and chances for their children. We will need science and technology at the core. The Global Health Initiative of Boston University is exactly that kind of science-based initiative to address the practical challenges of millions of people dying from lack of safe drinking water or transmission of disease. Jerry Kirsch is one of the world's authorities on this, and it's a, your privilege to have him lead this effort with so many other distinguished scholars. This is exactly the kind of thing I believe that universities must be doing in the 21st century. Second, we need what universities represent also, which is disinterest, not uninterest. We need unbiased approaches to these challenges, not the vested interests of corporate money in the short term or the political interests or the jingoism or the nationalism. We need a global perspective and the values of humanism and empathy uh, and shared responsibility that underpin it. And I know of no other institutions uh, in our country or in the world which better embody those values than universities and centers of learning. So the values of universities make us distinctive also. We can approach problems not feeling what's in it for you, but rather with the clear sense of our counterpart. We know, they know, that we're there to help as best we can. And that is the finest tradition of great universities like Boston University. And third, Universities are our longest term institutions. They even outlive governments. Uh, they outlive countries in many cases. You look at the longest lived institutions of Europe, they go back to the 10th century, the 11th century, Charles University of Prague and many, many others. And they have seen empires come and go and they have seen uh, countries come and go and they have seen war and they've seen peace and they've seen pestilence. We are built to last. 
Uh, and this is extremely important because what we need is at least a 100-year view of these problems and more. And we can have no doubt, I believe, Boston University is going to be around for that 100 years and more. And it needs to take and it will take the long-term view. All of this makes the university utterly distinctive, in my opinion, in the unique role that it can play to face these huge challenges. Now, it isn't easy. It's not easy at all. Universities have to struggle to find their foothold and their role and their voice in this. First, the science itself that is needed is disciplinary and translational. And that's why I think it's so thrilling that Robert Brown's your new president. Uh, as the provost of MIT, uh, he was exactly in the interdisciplinary problem-solving mode of a, perhaps uh, in, uh, uh, in recent history, the greatest of problem-solving institutions in the world. And that's what we need. But it's not easy for universities to take step out of normal disciplinary work. But the challenges of extreme poverty, that's not a department of extreme poverty. <laughs> that is agronomy. That's public health. That's environmental engineering. That's hydrology. That's uh, off-grid energy systems. That's even economics uh, and, uh, and other disciplines. And you need to bring them all together in order to solve the problems. Uh, Jerry Kirsch would tell you, you cannot solve public health problems through a medical school or a school of public health alone. This involves every aspect of economic life, infrastructure, engineering, uh, and, uh, and uh, the, the social sciences, and the cultural science as well, if we're going to deeply and sustainably get to the root of these challenges. So the interdisciplinarity is the first uh, challenge. Uh, the second challenge is the global view. Boston University started as a Boston University. Uh, I'm at Columbia University in the city of New York. Uh, we all started as local, local institutions and became national institutions uh, in recent decades. But now we have to become global institutions. And global means something more than the third year abroad. It even means something more than having foreign students with us. It means that accepting the responsibility of dealing in the world, anywhere in the world, is a core part of the challenge of a university. And that requires an outlook that I think we're coming close to but I know even at the greatest of universities, we're not there yet, fully embracing globalization and the reality that it means for us, for our lives, and for the future. And of course, it does mean in a struggle with budgets every day, and let's face what the practical challenges are that any of us face, paying the bills, meeting the payroll, finding ways to do things that look ahead before a lot of society has gotten to understand how important it is to invest in those areas. It means having the entrepreneurship, marshalling the resources, harnessing the talent in ways that often give a lot of quizzical looks at the beginning because one is trying to look ahead and act ahead. And acting ahead often uh, is, uh, uh, it meets a, a lot of headwind. These are all real challenges, but Boston University already demonstrates the excellence, the commitment, the vision, all the dots on the map that we were seeing of its locations all over the world in order to make this possible. And as I've said, I don't think you could have a, a, a more wonderful new president who has that kind of insight, knowledge, experience, uh, engineering capacity, and vision in order to pull this off. And, it's for that very special reason, personally, that I'm so honored to be part of today's symposium. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sachs, for your encouraging and inspiring remarks. And we look forward to hearing more from you later. For my introduction to the next speaker, I'm going to step for a moment, if you will allow me to, from behind the moderator's persona. 
The next speaker is familiar with the banality of evil. One sweltering afternoon in late August, I went to my brother's apartment in New York City to find out why we had not heard from him for 10 days and discovered his brutally murdered and decomposing body. Over the next several bizarre weeks, I lost two old schoolmates to homicide and saw another have his brains blown out by gunfire. As I struggled to make sense of my life, I came across a book with a title that exactly and aptly described the way I felt. It was called Night. It showed me how a person could rise from the ashes to create of his life a monument to decency, caring, and the human spirit. Its chilling revelations were yet an inspiration to a young man seeking hope. Dr. Ellie Wiesel is University Professor Andrew Mellon, Professor of the Humanities and Professor of Religion at Boston University. For decades, his has been a powerful voice on behalf of ethical practice in all aspects of human affairs. In this regard, he is the founding president of the Paris-based Universal Academy of Cultures and chairman of the Elie Wiesel Foundation for Humanity. He is a devoted supporter of Israel and has championed, among others, the cause of Soviet Jews, Nicaragua's Mosquito Indians, Cambodian refugees, and the victims of famine, genocide, and apartheid in Africa. For his work, Dr. Wiesel has been awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the Congressional Gold Medal, and the Medal of Liberty, the rank of Grand Croix in the French Legion of Honor, and in 1986, the Nobel Peace Prize. I'm honored to be a member of the same faculty and of the same human race as Dr. Wiesel. Please join with me in welcoming. President Brown, Mrs. Brown, distinguished colleagues, students, and friends, uh, I love beginnings, except in our tradition we know that God alone begins, but we can begin again. And you, President Brown, are now beginning again. And this beginning has brought joy and hope to all of us. You have created yesterday an ambiance, an atmosphere of generosity, friendship, and your words were so gracious that I cannot tell you enough how grateful we are to you and to those who elected you, including Elaine, naturally. Uh, I hope we shall continue in that spirit and work together for the future the illuminating future of Boston University. The topic given to me, actually, is following Jeffrey, is Boston University and the World, which is your topic, too. And uh, our challenge derives from the fact that while the 21st century is still young, the world we live in is rather old. The problems are old and new, and the responses that we heard, the challenges that we heard, are of such nature that I wonder how we can even approach one of them, not let alone all. Um, I heard a lot about the global uh, problems and uh, health problems, and I was thinking <coughs> that between my remarks, I too will offer you advice, President Brown, with your permission, what to do in our university, but that will come later. Um, the 20th century was actually a century marked by fanaticism. It was political fanaticism in Moscow, racial fanaticism in Berlin. And I'm afraid that the 21st century, Jeffrey, will be marked if, unless we are here to, to stop the, 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 the trend, the movement, by religious fanaticism again. We relive the Middle Ages. Fanaticism now in religion has become such a threat, such a danger, that I wonder even whether universities could could, could help in any way except think about it, analyze it. And the first advice, therefore, would be, Mr. President, is why not organize a kind of international conference here on fanaticism? I have uh, proposed it already to heads of states. Must be doing. 
They're afraid. <laughs> <laughs> so as a head of a university, you may have more latitude <laughs> and, 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 and surely more courage. <laughs> Speaking of course, Boston and the world, Boston University and the world, all true education is universal, we know that. And therefore it must begin at home and reach out as far as possible. Plato was Greek, Seneca, Roman, Descartes, French, Goethe, German, Shakespeare, English, Faulkner, American. And yet, is there anyone in literature or in philosophy more universal than any one of them? The Bible was given to the people of Israel. Is there a work that had and still has a greater impact on civilization as such? A small people, very small in the beginning, it remains small even today, but somehow the Bible, um, I think it was uh, a man named the Ashkenazi in, in Israel who said it was kidnapped by other religion. Thank God for that. We are very happy that they did. The only problem is, I wish Jeff, you should give us an advice. How could we maybe get some royalties on it? <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, Israel then would be so rich <laughs> that we could develop a Marshall Plan for the United States. <laughs> the deepened study of the conflict opposing Antigone and Creon, Faustus and Mephisto, faith and heresy, logos and ethos, cynicism and belief. Uh, of course, it transcends geographical borders and time. The questions raised by thinkers and scholars can be found in those contemporary students' study in their classrooms, what they do there, as does the stimulating invitations to give doubt its rightful place by Erasmus in Holland and Montaigne in France. Since my early childhood, I believed in study and its ability, its necessity to open vistas, curiosity, erudition, intuition, memory, a sense of wonder. All these are embodied in study. And I can tell you, President Brown, you should have, I'm sure you have seen it. We have here among the best students in, 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 in America. I have been probably in every university in America. I can tell you, these students here are so good, so eager, and so compassionate. Do you know how many of them, when they finish, they go to NGOs, not to Wall Street. They go to NGOs. Jeffrey, you and I have been in Moscow during those very, very dramatic days, Gorbachev and Yeltsin. I was, the, I was the last Westerner to see Gorbachev before he was ousted. <laughs> After we saw him, Yeltsin came in and literally threw him up, taking his car away from him. <laughs> <laughs> so we have seen how regimes change, it's true, how regimes change. But everywhere I went, I always see students who are so involved, so caring, and many of them come from our classes here. And we should be proud of that. There are three stages in man's life, said the Israeli. Youth is to make mistakes, maturity to fight, and old age for regrets. <laughs> <laughs> so we regret many things, of course. It's natural. Lost opportunities, vanished encounters, wrong decisions, refusals, and commitments. But one must never regret the efforts, ambitions, and energies one invests in learning. It's wrong to believe, said Gabriel Marquez, that old men cannot fall in love. One gets old when one stops falling in love. Replace love with learning, and we shall understand the magic of study. One minute before I die, I still want, with all my heart and mind, to learn more about the first secret of life and the final mystery of death. But I belong to a generation that realized that there are a thousand ways of dying. But what is the one to live one's life while one is alive? The importance of ethos is knowledge. The importance of memory is hope, like language. Knowledge can be a cure or a weapon, a curse or a blessing. It all depends what we do with it and for whose sake. Abstraction or abstract ideas or deeds, concepts, may bear some fruit, 
But when someone, a leader or a subordinate, any individual or group, try to transform human beings in abstractions, as was the case in Hitler's death factories and in Stalin's gulag, in his laboratories, it is humanity's honor and survival that are in jeopardy and disgrace. What lesson can be drawn from the horrifying discovery a year ago that many SS killers, those who killed men, women, and children, and they killed them with machine guns before doing so in gas chambers, they had college degrees, and some even had doctoral degrees. And of course, when we find these facts, we wonder about what to do about our fate in universities. The German universities then were the best in the world. Heidelberg, Freiburg, they were the best. And many of these officers came from those universities with doctoral degrees, some of them medical degrees, philosophy, theology, arts. How is it possible to combine higher education and cheap, vulgar murder? The visitor came to Heidegger to discuss philosophy about the general situation in Germany as well. Heidegger's reaction, he said to the visitor, look at Hitler's hands, aren't they admirable? My God, how are we to comprehend his fanatic loyalty to the Nazi party that lasted to the very end of the war? He paid dues at the very end of the war. How is one to understand his disciple and lover, Hannah Arendt's reconciliation with him after the war? Was it that to her, his originality as philosopher was more meaningful than his Nazi perversion? But that is a question that goes beyond the 20th century and his failings. Should we reject Plato for condoning slavery and showing such a dislike for poetry that really one cannot understand, really? <laughs> In his laws, really, Plato proposes to burn his dialogues. Plato approves Socrates' death sentence. Is he a bad philosopher for such aberrations? I do not think that Heidegger wrote anything derogatory of Jews, but others have done that before him and after him. Augustine declared that Jews are still around so that Christians could see in them descendants of Cain and their sins. Goethe hated scripture, which he called the pugwash of Egyptian Babylonian sodomy. Hegel, the great Hegel, said, the Jews are servile, incapable of liberty. They cannot escape slavery except by enslaving others. Uh, Kant had said some things that are, I don't want to repeat them, because I love Kant. <laughs> Listen to Voltaire. His, Voltaire said, we find in the Jews an ignorant and barbarous people who have long united the most avarice with the most detestable superstition and the most detestable hatred for every people by whom they are tolerated and enriched. Still, he added, we ought not to burn them. Well, several generations later, they were burned. How is one to compare? to comprehend Voltaire, the courage of Voltaire, with his anti-Semitism. I always grew up to believe that literature, art, and education in general constitute an indispensable shield that prevents a person or persons from committing excessive evil. Like culture, education is an ensemble of energies and aspirations, <clears throat> dreams and visions, memories and wounds. It is a point of departure and arrival it is the road, not, not necessarily a destination. It is desire rather than fulfillment. Now, someone who has, was fortunate enough, intelligent enough to learn to admire a poem by Schiller, a quartet by Beethoven, and a painting by Rembrandt, what happened to their education when they had the desire, the crazy, mad desire to kill? Had history gone mad? Is it that as often before, too many people forgot that war is an act of despair, whereas peace 
is an offering of hope. Einstein wondered whether God had a choice of what he wanted his creation to be. Is man meant to be God's failure? For theologians, really, that is the question. Are some of us condemned to be God's error, others his victims, and still others his orphans? Are these our only choices to find the key to the mystery of the Odyssey and human resignation to, uh, to evil and its power? For me, it is still a mystery. We need to have faith in education, in spite of what my generation has witnessed and endured. I still believe that whatever the existential question may be, teaching and learning one another, the art of living together, education must remain its principal component. For it is together that we can and must take part in the noble quest for learning and finding truth. But woe to us, said a French philosopher, our generation has discovered not absolute truth, but absolute weapons. So what shall we do with these absolute weapons in the 21st century? What is true of teaching, of course, is naturally Jewish studies in this university occupies a very special and warm place. The question is, I was asked by Elaine, what can we offer others? We surely can offer, first of all, the relationship between colleagues, which, which is very warm, I found it here, and mainly between teacher and student. It is exemplary, the way teachers here feel for their students. And that is a lesson. Do we teach memory? Of course, who doesn't? Actually, in, in antiquity, as we know, forgetting was on some occasions considered a positive phenomenon. In Greek mythology, Lite made the damned souls in hell forget their ordeal. But then, Elysia means truth which cannot be forgotten. Real truth is here to obsess us, to pursue us, to inhabit us, to enrich us. In real life, therefore, amnesia is a curse. To remember is to retrieve from the distant past people and events and incorporate them in our own awareness. It is to say no to the sand covering the landscape of our own very being. And within the framework of education, to remember is to acknowledge, to postulate that vanished lives, to leave traces and scars on the surface of history is essential and possible. All events are intertwined. All gates remain open to the search of truth. It is to reconcile justice and dignity. It is to affirm our human faith in, other, in the other's humanity. It is to confer meaning and nobility on fleeting endeavors. The challenge and threat to education really has a name, and I mentioned it earlier, is fanaticism. Fanaticism is the enemy to any university. And therefore, it is also a threat to the world. When fanaticism gains power, we are all in trouble. So this is the beginning of a new century and a new era in this university. And therefore, we must ask the question, how does one fight fanaticism? And again, the answer is simple, education. But it's a long process. Do we have time? That is the question. And here, we must say, as Boston University enters a new phase in its history, of course, it is with great measure of, measure of hope and real joy that we congratulate you, President Brown, and wish, wish you success and fulfillment in all your endeavors, following other presidents before, each with his own qualities and achievements, his imagination and experience. You will serve the goal of education and lift up the level and the hopes of this institution. What used to be a secret is now common knowledge. Boston University has become one of the finest institutions for higher learning in America. Its faculty is superb. Its students, young, vibrant, and eager to receive what their able teachers offer them in so many domains. They bring us pride. 
what is being taught here will be received elsewhere. But that has always been the case. Even before the advent of internet, what Spinoza explored in Amsterdam affected philosophical thoughts in Paris, London, Heidelberg, as did Kant and Kierkegaard, whose anguish before the good fascinated theologians of fear and theoreticians of trembling everywhere. On the frontispiece of the Palais Chaillot in Paris, the poet Paul Valéry engraved the following words. Il dépend de toi, passant, que je sois tombe ou trésor, que je parle ou que je me taise. It depends on you, passerby, that I be a tomb or a treasure, that I speak or be silent. And he said, ami, n'entre pas ici sans désir. Friend, do not enter this place without desire. And this appeal to fervor is to be heard in this venerable and inspired place as well. So students and teachers from far and near enter here, enter this place, and you will find fervor in it, and you will be enriched by it. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Wiesel, for your thought-provoking and inspiring remarks. We are moving into the second phase of our program today. We have a distinguished panel of Boston University faculty, who I will now ask to come to the stage, and I will introduce them as they proceed up here. Professor Dana Roberts. <coughs> it's Truman Collins, Professor of World Christianity and the History of Mission in the School of Theology. Professor Roberts. <laughs> Pro professor, professor Hussein Haqqani is Associate Professor of International Relations in the College of Arts and Sciences. <laughs> and Professor Gerald Kirsch, whom you've already met. <laughs> We will begin today with a presentation by Professor Robert. It's my privilege to give a five minute history lesson to talk about the roots of global engagement at Boston University. Now the slide above me shows the locations of the first 99 graduates of the School of Theology, the founding school of Boston University who had gone overseas by the year 1911. The organizers of Boston University were part of the Methodist movement, at that time the largest Protestant denomination in North America. Having expanded across the North America by mid-century, Northern Methodists turned their attention to two things, to education and to global outreach. They founded 54 colleges and universities in the United States in the late 19th century, including Boston University. Now this slide shows that the two biggest destinations for 19th century School of Theology graduates were China and India. You can't see India very well, it's off the map, but it has the, the largest number of circles in it. In both of those countries, Western missionaries founded the first colleges, universities, hospitals, medical schools, and social work. Early missionaries were bridges for intellectual traffic in both directions. Founding President William Warren came to BU from his ministerial post in Germany. He carried with him German ideas about the meaning of the modern university as a synthesis of liberal arts and professional training and interest in comparative religions and cultures. He wrote in our charter that the purpose of Boston University was, quote, to promote virtue and piety and learning in the languages and the liberal and useful arts and sciences, close quote. 
Warren therefore believed that all BU students should be required to be fluent in more than one modern language. Language study was thus a building block for global engagement. In the theology school of 1871, it was possible to study Arabic, Aramaic, Syriac, German, Spanish, French, Italian, Hindustani, Latin, or Chinese, in addition to the required biblical languages of Hebrew and Greek. Just as President Warren brought comparative studies from Germany, theology graduates returning from abroad used their knowledge to shape the American Academy, so that by 1869, introductory courses in Indian and Chinese history, language, and literature were offered by return missionaries. 1886 graduate John Ferguson went to China and founded both Nanjing and Zhaodong universities. He returned here for a PhD in 1902. As one of the earliest experts in Chinese art and architecture, Ferguson advised several successive Chinese governments and guided the acquisitions of Chinese art and artifacts for New York's Metropolitan Museum, Boston's Museum of Fine Arts, and the Smithsonian. One of the most important features of early Boston University's global engagement was recruitment of international students. And every BU graduate abroad was a pipeline for inter international students to come back to Boston. Thus, early international students clustered around the streams of dots that you see of graduates who went to those overseas locations. The first students from India enrolled in 1873. Helen Kim, first Korean president of the largest women's university in the world, earned her master's degree here in 1925. The first Chinese president of Nanjing Theological Seminary, Handel Lee, obtained his BU degree in 1922. In 1928, Timothy Ting Fang Lu of Peking University, author of the book China Today Through Chinese Eyes, was visiting professor at the, the, the theology school no doubt one of the first Chinese scholars ever to teach in the United States. Although the movement of Boston graduates into Africa was largely a product of the 20th century and so is not reflected on this map, African American students graduated from the theology school in its first class. The overlap between African American and global concerns was exemplified in such graduates as J.W.E. Bowen, class of 1885. He taught biblical languages at Howard University and then became first African-American professor and president of Gammon Theological Seminary in Atlanta. His edited volume, Africa and the American Negro, 1891, was a groundbreaking reflection on the interaction of African-Americans with Africa and a cry for social justice, both in the United States and abroad. In conclusion, the early global consciousness of Boston University faculty and students shaped the destiny of this university. The university was imprinted from the start by concern for comparative and cross-cultural studies, for building educational institutions overseas, and for global justice issues. The motto, learning, virtue, and piety, traveled from Boston around the world and came back again. Thank you, Professor Robert. <laughs> thank, you, thank you, Professor Robert. Our next presenter is Professor Hussein Haqqani. In my four years in the United States, I'm always amazed uh, by the American propensity to ask speakers to summarize complex issues in short durations of time. <laughs> once, I was, once I was asked to speak about the 14 centuries of Islamic history in seven minutes. <laughs> On another occasion, I was asked to give a 30-second explanation for why India and Pakistan are the most likely nations in the world to nuke each other. In that context, five minutes to talk about the role of a major international university in a changing international environment might actually be an improvement. 
In the prologue of his latest book, Identity and Violence, which incidentally comprises lectures given at Boston University's Pardee Center, Nobel laureate Amartya Sen narrates an encounter a few years ago with a British immigration official at Heathrow Airport. Professor Sen, who now teaches at a university across the river from BU, was at the time of this particular arrival in London, the master of Trinity College at Cambridge. The immigration officer looked at Professor Sen's Indian passport and noted his residential address on the immigration form as Master's Lodge Trinity College, Cambridge. He asked the professor whether he was a close friend of the master. <laughs> professor Sen, being profound as he is, says that this led him to wonder whether he could claim to be his own friend. <laughs> of course, had I been asked the same question in similar circumstances, I would have been relieved that at least the immigration officer did not assume me to be the master's domestic help, a terrorist, or a potential illegal immigrant. In almost seven centuries, as England's premier educational institution, Cambridge had never before had a South Asian head of college. The immigration officer at Heathrow was confronting the changing face of academia and was clearly not prepared for it. Universities in the Western world have, for the last several centuries, operated in a global environment dominated by European nations and the United States. As a student of international relations in my native Pakistan, I was sometimes disturbed by the fact that our courses in the history of international relations were nothing more than a recounting of efforts to maintain the balance of power in Europe during the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries. International economics was no better. The Europeans initiated the Industrial Revolution, and until Japan's emergence in the 20th century, capitalism remained a phenomenon of European peoples, including <coughs> their North American siblings. But as we enter the 21st century, we might be witnessing a major shift in the global center of gravity, in economic, political, and possibly intellectual terms. Professor Sachs has already spoken about it. This is the century of the rise of China and India. It is predicted that within the next 10 years, China will overtake Germany and Japan as the third or second largest economy in the world. In fact, if current trends persist, China might overtake the United States as the world's largest economy by the middle of the century. By then, Britain, Germany, Japan, and France will no longer be at the top of the league tables of the world's largest economies. India, currently number 12 among the world's 91 countries on the basis of GDP, will overtake France to become number five within the next 15 years, by 2020. While China and India increasingly occupy our attention in the economic realm, demographic changes are making India and the Muslim world the world's major source of working age populations and, in case people decide to go to war, potential soldiers. 30% of India's 1.1 billion people and almost 40% of the world's 1.3 billion Muslims are under the age of 15. The populations of Europe and Japan are aging while those in North America and China are not as plentiful in their supply of young workers. Only 20% of America's 300 million and uh, China's 1.3 billion people are part of the under 15 age group. Just as the European balance of power and the containment of Soviet communism were the major foreign policy and national security preoccupations during the 19th and 20th centuries, the threat of radicalism among the world's Muslims is fast becoming a significant issue in international relations today. The prospect of half a billion young Muslims embracing radical ideologies such as those espoused by Al-Qaeda and its associated groups means that Americans have to see the Muslim world as something more than just the source of cheap and as those who went to the gas station this morning know, not so cheap oil. Each of these changes has important implications for a university such as Boston University in our research and teaching, as well as in recruitment of new students. The rise of India and China demands that we enhance our already considerable capacities in studying these incre increasingly important countries. Courses in social sciences must be expanded to include ones that prepare our graduates for an Asian century. China and India are the emerging powerhouses of the world, the Muslim world, mired in its grievances and stagnation but controlling natural resources crucial to the global economy, seeks understanding and attention in complex and often violent ways. These facts ha would have to feature in our thinking just as BU's 
history and Western heritage is reflected in university life almost on a daily basis. The shifts in the world's political and economic axis impact and can be measured by the patterns of international student enrollment in US universities. In 1954, only 1.4% of the total number of students in American colleges came from outside the United States. By 1986, the number of inter international students had risen to 2.8% of total students. This year, 4% of all students in tertiary institutions come from other universities. There is clearly a global demand for education, and the flow of students to the United States from different countries will continue to reflect changes in demographic patterns as well as economic factors. The countries with younger populations will naturally have more potential students to send to American universities. Those with rising in incomes will be able to pay for it. A great university anticipates and keeps up with changes in the global environment. As ba Boston University prepares for a promising future under its 10th president, President Robert E. Brown, we must not ignore the challenges and opportunities represented by the rise of China and India and the revivalist stirrings as well as demographic changes in the Muslim world. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Haqqani. And now we'll hear from Professor Gerald Kirsch. Having set the time limit for Professor Haqqani at five minutes, I too will speak briefly about the issues of global health. And by this I mean the health of the globe itself, as well as the health of the world's people and the diversity of species that interact with and sustain us. I need not, and in fact do not have the time to expand on a few simple statements I offer as background. As Jeff Sachs pointed out so eloquently, our environment is stressed and degrading, and current practices are not sustainable. Population growth pressures the ability to produce food and provide the water needed for life. Despite advances in medicine, disease burdens are increasing largely among the poor and disenfranchised. We conquer some, smallpox for example, only to see it return as a specter hanging over us as some threaten to deliberately loose this ancient plague upon us once again. New diseases arise, such as AIDS, while the burdens of chronic cardiovascular illness, diabetes, cancer, obesity, and depression increase with the aging of our populations and the changing of our lifestyles. Our medicine is better than ever before, and yet we have the sense that we are steadily falling further behind. Public health, the application of sound scientific principles at the population level to prevent disease and promote health, receives lip service, too little support, and does not and cannot stem the tide. Yet this university is not sitting back and withdrawing into a comfort zone. On both our Charles River and medical campuses, we are harnessing knowledge conditioned by our values to improve health control disease, and achieve greater equity among people everywhere. We're doing this because we care, and because we know that knowledge in the hands of caring and educated people is powerful. We're applying network theory to better understand how biological systems interact with our environment. We're exploring the genome to find new ways to prevent HIV infection. We're addressing the causes of the high maternal mortality in developing countries. We're studying the ways to modify the impact of toxic chemicals in the environment on brain development in infants and children. We're demonstrating the societal benefits of preserving health on psychomotor development, cognition, and productivity, how health produces wealth. We promote oral health at home and abroad. We're developing and practicing preventive public health. We're helping to organize the services required to treat those with AIDS in resource-poor settings. And we are ensuring that all of this is done within an ethical framework consistent with the local cultures where we work. We are asking how health should be defined around the world today and what it should be in 50 years, and in so doing, we are determining what we need to do to ensure that we can achieve that goal. We are working together across the university while collaborating around the world, never dominating, 
always partnering, we're helping to build a clinical public health and research capacity. We're teaching our partners as we are learning ourselves. We're doing this in Latin America, in Africa, in the Middle East, in Central Asia, and in South and Southeast Asia, the corners of the world. And we do this together with our colleagues from these countries. And so, because of this, we are welcome. That welcome, that shared vision, that partnership allows our faculty, our students, our alumni, and our staff to educate, conduct research, produce scholarly treatises, provide services to the global society, help to develop sound policies, and together implement, evaluate them, and begin all over again as we find we need to know more, the essence of a university. In short, our health professional schools in medicine, dental medicine, and public health, and our biomedical, bioengineering, and biology programs on both campuses, we are truly forging our future in the most global sense possible. Without a healthy planet and a healthy people everywhere, none of us can be truly healthy ourselves. We have anticipated the challenges of poverty, development, ethics, and moral principles explored so well by Professors Sachs and Wiesel. And by our actions, we have seized the opportunity to address them in a global manner through the generation and application of knowledge guided by our values and ethical principles. Hail be you. Thank you, Professor Kirsch. And at this time, I would like to invite Professor Rizel and Professor Sachs to return to the stage. And you can come up on this side. On the stairs over there? Thanks. You're welcome. We have time for audience participation. Um, we have a mic circulating. I'm <clears throat> I will start things off by asking uh, first question. Uh, Professor Wiesel spoke of fanaticism. Tariq Ali has spoken of a clash of fundamentalisms, which is uh, a very apt uh, phrase, I think. And it, it appears that as we come closer together as a human community, uh, our differences become exacerbated. So it appears that uh, there is more need today than perhaps ever before for a manner of negotiating differences. And some of us at Boston University are engaged in a global ethics initiative. So I, I have this question to address to the panel. Do you have thoughts on how we might go about negotiating a common set of ethical principles by which we can live? And anyone can take that. <laughs> and you have 30 seconds. <laughs> I'll call on someone. If <laughs> <laughs> Professor Robert. Well, um, I think one way to do this is to, is to empathize and study many cultures so that we can understand each other's deepest humanity. I, am, I believe that science and technology are important, but unless we understand and study and appreciate the cultures of the people in the world, that science and technology will not be effective. I say that going back and forth on an annual basis to Zimbabwe and see where people sometimes reject solutions that we would appreciate because it's not consistent with their cultures. So one of the important things is to then integrate here in our university the study of science and technology with issues like values, cultures, worldviews, and by so doing, by putting all of those things together in one basket, we can come to a deeper understanding of our common humanity. Questions? Yes. Can I, can I just add oh, of course. Yes, Jerry. When I have uh, been asked to characterize what I have found at this university, I'm here less than two and a half years now, I talk about the fact that we have a great faculty and great students, and greatness involves ego, but the ego barriers 
are lower here than at many other institutions that I have been. And there's a real good reason for lowering the ego barriers. Because now, talking as a scientist, if you look at our genome, we're just a few percent different from a worm. <laughs> we, we have a, a common heritage. And if we don't understand that, um, that's when the ego barriers uh, rise up and prevent that kind of humanity that you were talking about, Ron. Thank you. I'm Michael Murphy from the School of Management. Thank you for your comments today. Uh, it's currently fashionable after Malcolm Gladwell's recent book to speak in terms of tipping points uh, in, in addressing some of these uh, types of macro level issues. I wonder, do, do you as panelists see that as a viable paradigm in this, uh, with regard to addressing poverty and the root causes of poverty and fundamentalism that I see is probably very intertwined? And if so, what specific steps or measures would you recommend that we as individuals and we as a university undertake? Let me say a word about that. Um, the world is uh, filled with the uh, uh, tipping points, if you will, or non-linearities, uh, meaning that uh, all sorts of things can uh, go terribly wrong. Uh, anarchy can, uh, uh, can, can break out uh, when underlying uh, conditions of poverty or, or disease or hunger occur, when an economic crisis allows a, a tyrant to come to power, uh, when fear becomes uh, amplified by itself in a in a dynamic way. So I think we're familiar from uh, ample human events that um, we do find such tipping points, if you want to call it that. Um, there are a few lessons, uh, though, also, I would say, from history, which is that if we can stay away from certain uh, boundaries, uh, most of life is not just tipping points. We can be fairly confident uh, of some continuity in, in society if we're not stressed to the point of mass crisis, pandemic disease, mass hunger, uh, mass unemployment, and so on. So taking a little bit of care, a little bit of insurance in our society, and a little bit of insurance in the world is a huge way, a, a hugely beneficial way to give us a, a bit of a buffer from disaster. And uh, this has lots of practical applications, it seems to me. One of the reasons why uh, I put so much stress on, uh, on the poorest of, of the poor is not only that their needs are the greatest on the planet, and as I said, uh, life and death issues for them, but at a very small cost, we could also, I believe, inoculate <coughs> our own society from the risks of, if you want, tipping points or epidemics of uh, huge distress and fanaticism and so forth. My own view is that a lot of what is f fanaticism and huge threats of violence have structural underpinnings that if we could avoid those disjunctions would also avoid the outbreaks of these disasters. Uh, I'm reminded uh, just a it doesn't have to be extreme poverty that brings these on economic crisis uh, like Germany experienced in the 1930s, which uh, opened up the possibility for Hitler to come to power, or what I witnessed in 1989 in Yugoslavia when there was a country in extreme duress of hyperinflation, and I thought that there was a practical way to stop the hyperinflation and keep the situation calm, and I recommended to the last prime minister of federal Yugoslavia, Mr. Ante Markovic, uh, a program and a strategy to postpone debt service payments. Europe said, well, we don't uh, postpone debt service of European countries. Yugoslavia has to pay. That's not the only reason why Milosevic came to power and why civil war broke out, but it's an example of the most basic lack of thinking about safety, buffers, a little bit of empathy, and a little bit of insurance. And so the point I'm making is that if we just took care, stopped our own frenzy of greed or short-sightedness, 
and gave ourselves a little bit more protection, we'd avoid many of these catastrophes, perhaps not all of them. May I make one simple remark? Uh, President uh, Brown again, one of the advice. <laughs> <laughs> I would like the global hell that you are conducting now at Boston University. Why shouldn't we declare hatred as an infectious disease? <laughs> Second, one word that has not been mentioned yet, either by Jeffrey or by me or any one of the panelists, the word terrorist. Terrorism, which was born in the 19th century, now is becoming today a world threat, a global threat, in fact. What should we do? Now, I, uh, I had or I'd organized a conference years ago, two years ago, actually, in a summit meeting called Te Fighting Terrorism for Humanity. We had some 20 heads of states. And they were actually, they, they all confessed. They don't know what to do with it. How can they fight terrorism? And my only advice was, I give advice always, I'm not her, but I like to give advice. <laughs> <laughs> so my advice was to declare terrorism a crime against humanity. And they, 12 of them came up to me, 12 heads of state, saying, we accept, but give us the definition. President Brown, why don't you ask the school, law school here to give us a definition? <laughs> How can, what definition should we give to terrorists so that terrorism should become a crime against humanity? It won't stop the suicide terrorists. They want to die. But it will stop the accomplices. To be indicted for crimes against humanity is not a simple thing. There is immediately no uh, statute of limitation. <coughs> and uh, the, the need and the, the, the obligation of any member of the United States, extradition and so forth. So you have already a lot of work to do, President Brown. <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, time for one or two more questions. There's a gentleman. Oh, do you have the mic? Okay. She has the mic. You have the power. <laughs> Besides being a student here at Boston University, I'm a member of another long-standing global institution, the Methodist Church. And earlier this week, a friend of mine and I here at BU made a pact to work for, towards nonviolence. And because of the things I learned in Dr. Roberts' class, I have no doubt that two Methodist women could accomplish this. <laughs> but I'm wondering what advice you might give my friend and me as we start out on our mission. <laughs> Professor Since Robert. I'm the Methodist on the well, panel. <laughs> I think that we can cover that in class. <laughs> Persevere. That's my advice. Uh, question. Another question. Yes, gentlemen. Hi, I'm John Paul Raquelme from the Department of English. I have another practically oriented question, but it's really institutionally focused, and it responds in part to what Professor Roberts said about the curricular history of Boston University. I would like to see us writing the history of the future of the curriculum at Boston University in order to change the dynamic on the ground, if I can call it that. And th this event, I think rightly, has been focused on global outreach but I'm interested in global inreach. What can we do here in order to change our profile? What kind of public adjustments can we make about our mission statement, standards for admission, the curriculum, and expectations of faculty in order to make the dynamic here more meaningfully global? So any suggestions? Can I, I'd love to hear them. Let me make a very brief response before allowing the patent, well, not allowing, inviting the patent. <laughs> <laughs> authoritarian streak. Uh, and, and, and let's recognize the fact that President Brown has appointed a council, the President's Council on Boston University in the Global Future, which surveyed the faculty some, and student body some time ago. So the university, uh, inspired by the President, is taking a very serious look at all of our operations that have any relevance to what we might consider global. So, panelists. I just have a very quick response. Uh, Sometimes I'm amazed at the fact that uh, however long the presentations, et cetera, might be, uh, when people discuss India, China, the Muslim world, everybody receives and no one responds. 
for example, none of the questions have been about any of those changes and how we can actually even focus on them. And that makes me wonder whether we are inherently ethnocentric. We can't get rid of the fact that you know European history is the history of civilization as far as we see it. Uh, that we can actually, we see these changes, we talk about them, but we want to wish them away. We want to get involved, not in the big picture issue of what is the world of tomorrow, but we want to get into the engineering part of it, of how we can deal with it. And maybe, maybe more important than figuring out uh, the uh, curricular changes, the technicalities of it, is just understanding the big picture. In 50 years, you're not going to be at the top of the heap. Better figure out who will and understand them. <laughs> Very good. You know, there's a lesson here. I use Herodotus in teaching my courses, History of Racial Thought, and he prefaces his histories by saying, I have given attention in this book to minor nations and great nations because some that have been great in the past are minor now, and some that are minor now will be great in the future because time and chance basically happens to them all. We have time for one more question. Yes, student, I think. Hi, um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about um, how Boston University could better um, use its resources and its understanding of the world in programs that already exist. I took part in uh, the Niger program, which is a the only African study abroad program in the university. And it's a great experience for students. It's very life changing. Um, but I would say it's a very one way street in that it's um, almost harmful rather than helpful for the people working and living there. Um, and in a place of absolute poverty, I think this is a huge issue that we should be looking at. So, We are. Um, and, and part of that relates to uh, making the connections across the university and thinking very carefully about what it is that, that we can uh, accomplish. And it's, it is true that um, we can loose a horde of students and faculty on a poor country and um, in the name of academic programs and find that we're taking resources away as they tend to our needs. Um, and we're very cognizant of, of that as not the route to go. And so uh, in, in part, um, there is a wind of change in, in terms of curriculum and, and engagement. There is a connection between the two campuses and the disciplinary and the interdisciplinary opportunities that that uh, presents to us, um, as well as an increasing focus on places where we can, in fact, in partnership, make a difference. And one brief example, the efforts that the university is making in the small country of Lesotho to deal with their huge HIV uh, epidemic. At this point, I would like to invite our provost, David Campbell, back to the podium for closing remarks. David? My closing remarks will be very brief. They're simply to thank uh, the panelists, the speakers, and especially our two uh, co-chairs for having organized a session that I at least found uh, inspiring, challenging, and uh, frankly, somewhat daunting. So I'd like to give a round of applause to all of them, please. Before, before we break, please, before we break, I'd also like to thank them for the remarkable job of staying as close to schedule as I have ever seen at a conference of this type. We have, we have short, brief applause. We have now a half hour break, after which you want the image of Google Earth in your mind. We've been looking away from a far distance in space. Now we're going to focus in on Boston University at the city and the city starting at 11 o'clock. I hope all of you will be back to join us. Please enjoy the break and talk to the speakers. Thank you all.